welcome to the Simple Steps Personal Finance Podcast, bringing personal finance to you step by step. This is episode three. Let me start off with a big thank you. If you've been listening to this podcast from the very start, thank you so much. We've got the foundations out of the way now and it's time to start building. I've been pretty harsh in my tone so far and I will be lighting up a little now. I will be offering much more in the way of practical help to you now that you understand my my seven simple steps framework and the overriding arc that any guidance I offer should be viewed in. As you no doubt will have realised from my first couple of shows, the main theme for the simple steps approach is to be debt free over the long term. The reasons for this are simple. If you are out of debt, then that means your money is working for you. Any excess cash will be working to create more money, be it interest earned or dividends from stocks, for you. Also, in times of crisis, when life takes an unexpected detour, having no debt payments is a huge blessing. You're not struggling to scrape together the monthly payments needed to carry the debt. And there's no chance of you getting behind or defaulting on borrowed money and so destroying your credit worthiness in the eyes of the banks. The only real acceptable debts are our mortgages and student loans. Mortgages are unfortunately necessary to start your journey onto the property ladder these days in Britain. The cost of housing today is just too much that the average salary versus the average house price means a mortgage is virtually essential to make the move. Average income is around £25,000, and the average house costs £160,000. That means an average couple would need to borrow just over three times their combined salary. You'd also need a deposit somewhere in the region of 5 to 10%, so 8 to £16,000. That's a lot of sacrifice and saving to get your foot on the ladder. Now, I'm sure I'll cover mortgages in more detail in another show, but let me finish this little aside with this thought. If your finances are a bit out of control and you're not quite sure how much you spend each month, what are the chances you could save eight, 10, 16,000 pound over a couple of years? I agree, the odds aren't great. So that's the theme of the show today, how to get a grip on your finances in practical terms. Before we move on to that, I also mentioned student loans as being an acceptable debt. For those of you out there with student loan debt, and that figure is growing constantly and the debt amount sadly rises each year also, here's something for you to pin your hopes to. The student loan operates more like a tax. Like any tax, you have to be earning more than the amount you need to pay. Simply put, if you aren't earning enough, then you won't be paying anything back. Now current rules state that 9% of any income above £21,000 a year is the debt repayment amount. So let's look at some quick examples. You earn £17,000 a year. You're paying nothing back. Student loans are cool, aren't they? You earn £22,000. Uh-oh, I've got to repay my loan. But wait, the repayment is only 9% of the £1,000 you earn above the 21 k threshold. So 9% of £1,000 is £90. £90 a year when you earn 22000 If you earn £50,000 a year, you'd be paying back about 215 a month, but your take-home pay will be about 2800 so it's hardly the doorway to poverty. On average, student loan debt for graduates in 2014 will be £44,000, so this debt is probably never going to get paid off. And few people know that student loans are written off after 30 years, So if you pay the amount due, treating it as an extra tax, it'll either take care of itself if you earn a high enough amount, or it'll peter out as you get older. So it's not worth losing sleep over. I'll talk more on a later episode about student loans, I'm sure, but carry that message as peace of mind for now. You can't pay back what you don't earn. So getting a grip on our finances, where do we start? And what does practical help sound like? Now, the starting point is always the same. Whoever you are, however much you earn, whatever age you may be, we need to see where our money goes. 
Now, how do we do that? Some financial people will tell you to keep a spending diary, and I found that to be a real pain, and something I couldn't maintain for a week, never mind a month. The best method in my mind to seeing where your money goes is looking at where it just went. I know, I'm like Nostradamus, right? Take a look at the last two or three months of your statements, and you'll have a pretty good view of how you spend your money. So, here's my first practical tip. Take a look at my spending plan template from the website that's sspf.co.uk and click resources in the top menu. The important thing here is to look through your spending and allocate it to certain categories. We're interested in how much is being spent on the essentials of life. Food, shelter, gas, electricity, water, the utilities, transport. And then the nice to haves, the modern conveniences like phones, internet access, satellite or cable TV. Then, how much do we spend under the personal lifestyle categories? How much cash do you take out of the wall each month? What do you spend on socialising, eating out, going to the movies? We want to put down on paper how much is being spent, if any, under each category suggested in the plan. At this point, we're not judging the money being spent. I'm not looking for you to defend or justify or anything like that. We just want an honest picture of where the money has gone over the last two or three months. You can either do a spending plan for each of the last two or three months, or do one big one and then average the amount over those months. Either way is absolutely fine. We just want to see what an average month in your financial life kind of looks like. This will be a nice starting point for us to create a spending plan each month to deliberately plan where your money will go. Now the process of gathering this information and putting it into categories, it might take you a couple of hours but I guarantee you it'll be a real eye-opener. Every time I've done this with someone, they have been incredibly surprised by at least three categories on the plan. Usually, how much they spend on miscellaneous stuff, how expensive the necessities of life actually are, and if they're a little overdrawn at the end of each month, how easily they could have had money left over if they had just done things a little differently. It's never a nasty surprise. There is always a feeling of enlightenment as you now see the full picture, not just the corner of the jigsaw. And there's always a a feeling of hope for the future because usually with just a few tweaks, not a complete overhaul of your life, just a few tweaks, the picture can be really brightened up and the money will flow much easier. I've every confidence that you'll get the same empowering relief from doing that same exercise. Another thing you should know is to calculate how much you actually earn. I'm often gobsmacked that people don't know their current salary or how much they get paid after taxes, etc. each month. Often, all that people remember is their starting salary, but they don't remember any annual raises or changes due to new positions or roles or promotions. Then there's no idea of what they get paid after income tax and national insurance and student loan contributions and employee pension deductions are made. So that's another thing I'd like you to look at. Get out your last pay slip or download it from wherever your company publishes them. Note the gross salary amount. Then note the net pay amount. The gross salary is before tax and the net pay is after tax and any other deductions. You'll be shocked at the difference between the two, not least because income tax is anywhere up to 45% of what you earn. And any other deductions can really start to become quite sizable once you get into higher earning levels. National insurance is often around 10% in addition to income tax. At this point, you're likely to be elbow deep in bank statements and pay slips. So before we tidy everything away and concentrate solely on our spending plan sheet or the sheet of paper that you've, you've written out, Let's look at the gross salary amount and verify that you're being taxed correctly and the amount looks correct. HMRC, the government tax office, looks after the payslip collection of tens of millions of adults in this country. And as you would expect, it doesn't get all of them correct. There's a thing on your payslip called your tax code. And that tells their computers and your employer how much to take from your salary as tax. If that code is wrong, then they may be taking too little, in which case they'll ask you to pay them back, or too much, in which case you're actually owed a refund. Now, either way, 
you want to be paying just the right amount. No more, no less. You, your life could do without the hassle of doing otherwise. You don't want to be in communication with HMRC over many things. So jump on a website like thesalarycalculator.co.uk and use their quick tool to check your payslip. If it's wrong, you'll be able to contact HMRC to sort it out and verify your tax code for you. If it's fine, you'll have peace of mind that you won't get hit with a tax bill somewhere down the road. Now that website was the salarycalculator.co.uk. All of these episodes, I do a transcript and show notes. So if you're ever looking for a link or you can't remember something that's been said here, jump on the website and you'll be able to read or click straight through to any sites that I've recommended. Anyway, how does your salary affect your spending plan? Well, of course we want to spend only what we earn. Ideally, less than what we earn. So your spending plan each month should be written in a way that you spend or allocate all of your net pay that's your, your take-home pay, the amount that hits your bank account each month. If we look at the average month that you've prepared by looking at your last two to three months of activity, you'll be able to see whether you routinely overspend your monthly money, in which case you're likely to have loans or credit cards or uh, often used overdraft in your picture. Or if you don't spend all of your money each month, you'd expect to have some savings in an account somewhere. In my experience, it is rare that someone will overspend drastically each month, taking home £1,500 after tax and spending £1,600 is much more likely than bringing home £1,500 and spending 2500 The reason? Lack of awareness leads to minor overspending. Going off the reservation and living like someone else leads to maxing out a credit card from scratch in a week. It's much more common for someone to just miss the mark by a little consistently. Then, when you look back in a year, you realise you have £1,500 worth of credit card debt. And that's good news in a way, honestly. If you're not planning where your money goes and you overspend £50, £100 each month, then that situation is quickly fixed. If you put down on paper where the money should go and put limits on the stuff that gets out of hand and you'll feel like you get a raise... Instead of overspending each month, you can live roughly the same, even live closer to your real desired lifestyle, and have 50 or £100 left each month, solely from planning the spending ahead of time. Now it feels like I'm skipping a little here, so let's look at how you practically do that. First things first, do the average month spending plan like I mentioned. Get the statements check your payslip. Don't just pretend you did. Pause me, come back to this if you need to. What's the picture look like? Are you earning enough, but you're spending it unwisely? A little too much on nights out or hitting the ATM a little too often? Or are you living a a tight, no frills existence and there's just not enough money coming in to cover even that? Okay, so let's do some discussion on what you've found. First off, you've probably seen that just living these days is expensive. Paying rent or a mortgage is more than likely to be your major cost each month. Food is expensive, not only grocery shopping at the supermarket, but eating out, getting takeaways, they rarely add up to some frightening figures pretty quickly. What else? TV packages, broadband, mobiles, landlines. Once you start adding up the different providers, these also lump together to be a pretty chunky figure. Transport. Have a car? Do you use public transport or tubes and trains? Cars are expensive. Petrol prices have dropped in the last few weeks, but they've been permanently high for a couple of years now. And most of your average month spending plans will either have car insurance on direct debit or not include it at all. Motoring costs. And I'm sure your sheet is reflective of that if you've got a car. Now, public transport tends to be cheaper, but the closer you get to the big cities, particularly the London system, the cost of trains and tubes has become substantial. It's not uncommon for people in my area of the southeast to pay £4,000 a year on a season ticket just to travel to their work. That's a big chunk of your spending plan right there. What about the spending that isn't pretty fixed amounts each month, like the ones I've just mentioned? What about socialising? 
going out for drinks, dancing, dating, it won't feel like huge amounts at the time. Look at it as an average over a few months and it'll probably shock you. Same with things like subscriptions to Netflix, Amazon, magazines, anything hobby related. On their own, the amounts aren't too bad. Add them together, they can start to look a bit intimidating. Once you see it all laid out, you can start to impose yourself on the spending and you won't feel like you're being unjustified. It's your money. You are right to spend it how you please. You are also the only source who can say what means something in your life. If you want to spend your time in a certain way and your financial spending isn't reflecting that, then now you have the canvas in front of you to paint a better life. Like shopping, but can't afford to do it every week? Can you see where cutting down certain spending elsewhere would free you up to do so? Do you want to go and see your team play all the home games? Maybe it's worth cutting down on some of the treats to make room for this important one. Every spending plan will look different. The numbers are unique. Your behaviour is unique to you. Your desires and the life you want to lead are unique to you. Sure, we all need to keep a roof over our heads, stay fed, keep the heating on, be able to get to and from work. But the bits around the edges and how we do them, they're what makes us us. So it's really important that when we try to move some of this money around, we stay true to what we ourselves want to achieve. My first step in assessing somebody's monthly spending is how can we stop spending so much without taking away the things you've been doing? The quickest way to do that is to spend less on the stuff you were doing, stuff like mortgages, utility bills, broadband packages, car insurance, even grocery shopping. These are all areas that you can look for a better deal and potentially save a couple of hundred pound every month. Fixing to a lower interest mortgage rate has the potential to save you a lot of money if your current deal is not competitive. It could also guarantee your monthly payment would not fluctuate for two, three or even five years if you fix to a deal that long. That makes consistent monthly planning a real possibility. Utility bills, gas and electricity are another area where people very rarely look to save money yet they are a high monthly cost. All providers are not the same. The gas and the electricity all comes from the same pipes. It's all the same stuff. But the customer service and the prices are different across all companies. They're even different across regions. And my quick tip here is to sign up for Martin Lewis's Cheap Energy Club offered through the Money Saving Expert website. You can Google it, but it's a all one word, moneysavingexpert.com slash cheapenergyclub. Key in the details from your last bill and see what savings are possible. Again, picking a fixed deal would mean your monthly direct debit payment stays consistent and helps you plan your monthly spending, as the money goalposts won't be moving as much. There are search engines out there to analyse your mobile phone bills and reduce them to the cheapest tariff for your typical use. There are a whole host of comparison sites to help with car insurance. The trick with any insurance product is to never auto-renew. When your policy expires at the end of another year, you must, and I beg you, you must shop around for a better deal. Even if it's only so you can go back to your current provider and use that new quote to bargain down to a reduced renewal amount. You must shop around. Otherwise, the cost goes up every year and you're going to pay them. When in reality, you could have saved money or at least paid no extra each year. A few years of doing that, you're wasting hundreds of pounds. So you must, must shop around. So as you can see, there's, there's lots of avenues to reduce your expenses from the stuff you already pay that won't negatively affect your lifestyle if you tweak them. You might save a couple of hundred pounds just on them. Then we start to look at personal behaviour. Nights out, eating out, grabbing a coffee every morning, stopping past the Tesco Metro on the way home. You'll be able to see how much you've been spending on that sort of thing. Does it look reasonable to you? If it does, and you have money left over each month, have at it. Carry on. Good for you. Well done. If it looks a little heavy to you though, I have some tips for you. The first would be set a limit. Agree with yourself that a set amount will be used for spending cash, miscellaneous spending. It's actually wise to withdraw that money in part or in full as cash, as notes. After all, once cash is spent, you're done. There's no overdraft or credit on £10 notes. That way, you can plan the rest of your spending in the knowledge that you won't destroy the plan with one heavy night out. 
In other areas, buying some top-notch coffee from the supermarket and making your own hot drinks at work is much cheaper than that rush hour latte every day. Keeping a frozen pizza or a couple of ready meals at home can really save you on those nights that you don't want to cook and you might have opted for a takeaway instead. Little things that can really save you money and help you keep your plan on track. None of this is anything other than common sense. But as you well know, the obvious things in life, sometimes they just need to be pointed out again to you. Getting a grip on your spending really boils down to knowing where it is going. Take a copy of that average month spending plan and this time change the amounts of it. Set a limit on spending money. See how much you could save by looking for better deals on your fixed bills. See what you would save by axing some of your monthly subscriptions if they're not giving you value for money. Make sure on an average month you come in under budget, not overspent. It's entirely normal that over a life we just accrue step by step little things, little things that start to add up to a lot of money over time. Now that plan that you now have, that adjusted desired plan, that's going to be next month's plan. I want you to try to put that into action. Hit the internet to search out deals. Check out Money Saving Expert for tips on virtually all areas of normal spending. Set a limit on your spending cash. Look to scrap any direct debits that you you don't remember having or you no longer use. Cut the fat off this thing. Take a morning one weekend to do this and it'll be the best hourly wage you've ever earned. I promise you. If you really go at this thing with a scalpel, you can save hundreds of pounds. Next time, we'll look at how to simplify this new world of yours. Once you've got a good grip on your spending, you can then look to automate some of that good behaviour. We can also look to see how good behaviour can pay us for our effort. For now though, plan next month's money, on purpose, on paper. Now you might not do it perfectly, but you will be in the ballpark, and the month after, you'll be closer still. I suggest you take time to plan every month in advance. The process gets quicker and quicker, it takes me just 5 or 10 minutes a month these days. But it also allows you to adjust for the special nature of each month. Is that a birthday month? Is it Christmas happening? Are you on holiday then? Do you want to have more nights out that month? Or treat yourself to a a present? Planning every month individually gives you the freedom to tweak. And it keeps your hands on your money. If you keep your hands on your own money, you're able to control it, give it boundaries, and make it work for you. And as a result, you get more out of it. So my tips for this episode then are... Analyse where your money has recently gone. Check your salary and your tax code and know how much you earn each month. Construct an average month and tweak it to your desired amounts. Look for ways to spend less on essential big bills. And finally, plan how next month's money will be spent. So they're my tips. As I said, next time we're going to look at how to simplify your finances practically to make life smoother, less complicated. I'll also give you some pointers on how to handle any debt payments that you might have so that we can achieve our long-term goal of being debt-free and the owner of all our income. Thanks for listening. That's it for episode three. For more information, check out sspf.co.uk for show notes and transcripts of each episode. This podcast is copyrighted of Simple Steps, Personal Finance Limited and can be shared freely. The SSPF podcast is available as direct download on Android RSS, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Vimeo, and Dailymotion. We're here however you want us. If you like what you're hearing, please leave a review so others know to listen in. A big thanks to partnersinline.com for the music used throughout this episode. See you next time 